Good morning. My name is Megan Murray. I'm calling in from Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm a professor of global health and social medicine at the Harvard Medical School and a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I am really delighted to be here with you today. I wish we could all be here in person. I wanted to thank the organizers for asking me to present on a global perspective on TB control during the COVID-19 pandemic. In October of last year, the WHO, World Health Organization, announced that TB deaths had risen for the first time in more than a decade, a rise which was attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic and the way it had disrupted TB services. This result was published in the Global TB Report and sparked, it sparked a great deal of concern that we would see a, res, a reversal of the slow decline in TB incidence that had been observed over previous years. Here are a group of graphs from the, that were published in the annual report. They show that in a series of countries, different countries with high burdens of TB, that TB deaths rose sharply between 2020 and 2021. In some cases, China, for example, the, on the far right of the top column, top row, uh, they returned to baseline by 2020, while in others, they continued to be above the expected level for the foreseeable future. But notice that the title of the graph is the estimated deaths and that the x-axis goes out to 2024. So clearly, this is not the actual death rate from TB. That's really hard to measure on a population level. And if it's not actual deaths, it's reasonable for us to ask how these mortality rates were estimated. They were based on the fact that TB case notifications, meaning the number of TB cases reported to the health services, abruptly declined in many countries starting in 2020. These data are from India, and they were obtained from the NICSHE database. NICSHE is a data management tool that tracks TB notifications in both public and private sectors. And you can see here that the decline in case notifications occurred immediately after the first major lockdown in India. And of course, that makes sense. As we know, it was a very challenging time for people to access medical care during that time. The picture on the right is of Delhi uh, in lockdown. Lockdown was uh, stringently enforced and there was almost literally no one on the streets during that period. WHO reasoned that the fall in notifications and was due to people with TB who were being missed and therefore not adequately treated. And because of this failure to diagnose and treat, they assumed that mortality would increase. So the estimates we saw in the previous slide are based on the assumption about the number of people who likely went undiagnosed and the death rate in untreated TB. But as David Dowdy, a professor at Johns Hopkins, notes in this editorial in The Lancet, the WHO team made a very strong assumption that the number of actual TB cases had not declined and that the observed fall off was entirely related to people being unable to access care and therefore to be notified. But was this true? Could lockdown have prevented TB transmission and therefore contributed not only to a lack of care but also to a real reduction in incidence? This table is from a study by Saloni and colleagues that was conducted in 2020, which modeled the possible impact of COVID-19 and its population at level interventions on TB incidents. The authors considered a number of the factors that have an impact on TB incidence. These include the fact that TB transmission was likely reduced to declines due to declines in mobility. They estimated, as you see on the top line here, by 50%. But also that there would be patient and health service delays in presenting, which could prolong, result in prolonged infectiousness, leading to increased opportunity for transmission as well as reductions in treatment completion of notified patients receiving first line here at FL and second line drugs, SL, as well as reductions in drug resistance testing, which may have allowed MDR-TB to remain undetected and inadequately treated. The baseline scenario assumes that COVID affected all of these parameters. The study looked at levels in India, Kenya, and Ukraine, but for simplicity, I'm only showing you the model results for India. The top two figures here are the results of this model um, on incidents on the left and deaths on the right in the baseline setting. But the authors also conducted a sensitivity analysis 
to see how different things would be if these assumptions were relaxed. And what you see in the lower set of figures is that the single assumption with the most impact on TB, the TB trajectory was the assumption that TB transmission had been reduced. Had it not been, incidence would have been far higher. But is it possible that in reality, it might have actually been lower? In other words, was it possible that transmission was reduced by more than 50%? People say that hindsight is 2020. And of course, it would have been impossible to estimate by how much mobility was reduced in the immediate period after lockdown. But here is a study that used cell phone location data to measure reductions in mobility to different types of places in India during the early pandemic. And you see that at least for some places, mobility was reduced by more than 50%. For example, there was a 74% reduction in mobility to retail destinations. In case retail does not sound like a place where people can be infected by TB, I've added this photo of an Indian market. Crowding is the rule and is possibly the, probably the place where most close contact happens outside of, the, of, of individuals' households. So it's certainly possible that TB transmission was reduced by a greater amount than was anticipated in the Saloni modeling study, and therefore that at least some of the decline in TB notifications represented a real decrease in cases and not just a decrease in reporting. How much of a difference could these kinds of changes in mobility make for rates of transmission? Influenza is another pathogen, which like TB is transmitted through the aerosol route. These figures are data on reported cases of influenza in, in uh, 2020 in green and in previous years. Uh, and it shows a dramatic decline around the time lockdown was started compared to the trajectory of flu in, in other periods. The figure A is Northern China, figure B is Southern China, and figure C is the US where lockdown was not as rigorously enforced as in China. We could speculate that this decline in flu cases could also be a fall in notification due to reduced access to healthcare. But since COVID symptoms are very similar to flu, and, excuse me, and since testing was encouraged in symptomatic people, it seems unlikely that flu would have been underdiagnosed during this period. There's also evidence that COVID also transmitted through the aerosol route reached higher incidence in areas with higher mobility. This is a study from my colleague at the Harvard School of Public Health, Yonatan Grad, which shows that in New York City, areas with higher SARS-CoV-2 prevalence in panel A were also those with higher levels of mobility shown in panel B. The graph in C shows that this relationship is linear. But what about other factors that might contribute to changes in TB incidence apart from mobility? We know that case notifications fell the most in the highest burden countries, highest TB burden countries, as opposed to those that enforced the most rigorous lockdowns. Here is a list of the countries which reported the most extreme reductions. In their review of the intercepting pandemics of TB and COVID, Kirtan Detta and a group of his colleagues summarized the data supporting the idea that the decline in notifications did truly represent a real increase in deaths. They noted again that most extreme reductions were from the high burden TB burden countries, where lockdowns varied by duration and stringency, and that the timing of TB incidents usually occurred after COVID, COVID infection. Data from South Africa from this same study showed that the number of tests performed for TB fluctuated with COVID rates. As COVID rates rose, seen in the dashed line, TB testing fell off, shown in blue. And conversely, as COVID rates declined, testing partially resumed. This set of figures sh shows the actual number of tests, uh, as well as the number of positive cases and the number of drug resistant cases in, in relation to what was expected based on pooled data from previous years. All of these numbers declined. Data from China tell a similar story. In this case, regarding delays in accessing care for people who are eventually diagnosed with TB. The colored lines represent TB notifications in different years, with purple being 2020. And the table below shows that patient delay, meaning the time from 
the time from the onset of symptoms to reporting to the health system was longer in 2020 than in previous years. <clears throat> Turning to a study from Northern Italy, these figures show that there was a higher loss of follow-up among TB patients uh, in TB care and a higher death rate among people who, who were diagnosed with TB during the COVID peak. Again, providing evidence that health services were failing in that period. So taken together, it seems that while transmission probably did fall and the overall incidence of TB may have been less in, than in previous years, there was also a failure to provide TB services, including testing and follow-up, as well as a delay on the part of patients who found it difficult to access care during lockdown. These conclusions were also supported by a recent report from the US CDC, which found that in the US, TB cases fell in 2020 and remained lower than expected in 2021. The CDC suggests that not only was there a true reduction in incidence, but also that there was a reduction in detection of those cases that did occur. Other aspects of the COVID epidemic may have had a longer term, uh, term effect on TB. This study shows that BCG coverage fell in many countries in 2020 by as much as 96% in Bangladesh and 50% in India. This group modeled the potential impact of this fall off in PCG on pediatric deaths due to TB under a number of different scenarios related to when and if catch up occurred, meaning whether kids who missed their BCG at birth were vaccinated later. The figure on the right, the left side of that shows the actual reported BCG, the percent of increase in deaths given this decline in coverage, while the right shows the number of additional deaths that were estimated compared to what would have been expected if the decrease in BCG had not occurred. The orange scenarios are based on the projection that BCG fall off would last only three months, while the right assumes that it lasted for six months. In the worst case scenario, TB child deaths increased by more than 15%. Other preventive measures also suffered. This study from Ethiopia showed that the provision of TB preventive care to child contacts fell off considerably in the period of October to December in 2020. WHO estimates that preventive care fell off for HIV infected patients uh, in 2020, but it, that's demarcated in, in yellow on the figure on the right, but not for children in the same period as demonstrated by the, the figures, the, the graph in green. Another aspect of TB prevention may, that may have been disrupted by COVID involves the factors that lead to TB susceptibility. Among many other social determinants, undernutrition is known to be a major contributor to TB risk and to be affected by the hits to the economy that COVID created. These figures show that while the estimated number of stunted children fell globally between 1990 and 2020, that decline has leveled out and even reversed slightly in 2020. Stunting is a good proxy of general population level nutrition. And these data suggest that this risk factor may have increased in many high burden countries and could have led to an increase in TB susceptibility on a population level. So what can be done? Here are some recommendations uh, that came from a New England Journal of Medicine editorial from Madhu Pai at McGill and Sumya Swaminathan of WHO. They note that in the short term, it will be necessary to reduce COVID levels globally, and especially in high burden TB countries. And this means getting vaccines to everyone who needs them. It will also be necessary to continue to document how COVID has affected TB and to use the tools that have been developed for COVID, things like dashboards for up-to-date reporting and the deployment of more sophisticated indicators like testing positivity to measure TB incidence. Longer term, we need to recognize that like COVID, TB is a pandemic that kills large numbers of people, even if it is one that generally does not affect high-income countries. Surely the tools that we have developed in the fight against COVID can also be used to address this devastating disease. Thank you.